Hello and welcome everyone to the expert webinar, Testing for COVID-19 with Droplet Digital PCR, hosted by BioRad. My name is Carolyn Reifsnyder. I'm the Global Director of Product Marketing in BioRad's Digital Biology Group and your host for today's webinar. Joining me today is a panel of experts I'll introduce in just a moment. First, a short introduction and a few housekeeping notes on webinar logistics. The webinar will last approximately one hour. Following the three presentations by our speakers, we'll have five minutes of live questions and answers. The webinar will be available on demand after our live presentation today, and you'll be able to download the slides from today's talk along with web links from the resource list on your screen. Throughout the webinar, feel free to use the question and answer box on the left-hand side of your screen to submit your questions directly to us. We'll get to as many of your questions as we have time for, and if we can't get to your question today, we'll personally follow up with you over the next few weeks. Also, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the Q&A box to report them. An outbreak of pneumonia caused by novel coronavirus in China was identified and reported to the WHO on December 31st, 2019. The rapid spread of the virus to numerous areas throughout the world has necessitated preparedness and response in healthcare and lab facilities. The availability of specific and sensitive assays for the detection of the virus are essential for accurate diagnosis of cases, assessment of the extent of the outbreak, monitoring of intervention strategies, and surveillance studies. In today's webinar, you'll hear about BioRad's approach in partnering with CLIA labs like BioDesix, as well as information on our emergency use authorized test using droplet digital PCR. The test is a partition-based endpoint RT-PCR test. It's intended for the quantitative detection of nucleic acid from SARS-CoV-2 in upper respiratory specimens from patients suspected of having COVID-19 by their healthcare provider. The BioRad SARS-2 SARS-CoV-2 DDPCR kit is a powerful diagnostic tool in the battle against COVID-19 and is the second emergency use authorized test that BioRed has brought to market in recent weeks. From digital PCR and qPCR to serology and standards, BioRed has a comprehensive tool set for diagnostics and research. Now I'd like to introduce our panel. First, Dr. Gary Pistano. Gary is the Chief Development Officer at BioDesix. In today's webinar, he will talk about the validation and performance of their molecular test, as well as their experience in real world clinical testing. Next, Dr. Monica Herrera. Monica is the R&D program lead for prenatal testing and infectious disease at BioRad's Digital Biology Group. She's going to take us through an overview of BioRad's emergency use authorized test. Thirdly, Dr. Diana Marr. Diana leads the applications development team at BioRad's Digital Biology Center. Diana will talk about droplet digital PCR tools for vaccine and therapeutic development. Gary, over to you to kick us off. Thank you, Carolyn, for the introduction and um, the invitation to present on what Biodesix has been doing with the SARS-CoV-2 DDPCR assay in our laboratory. Uh, we're happy to have this opportunity to introduce the company and to tell you specifically how that test has now been deployed in hospital testing. A little bit before we get into test development and, and test use uh, commercially um, about Biodesix, we have two core business units. Um, today, we won't focus much on biopharma partnering, though in terms of our core business, uh, which is really in oncology, and now has been updated to include at least SARS-CoV-2 in terms of virology. We conduct a number of studies with biopharma, including discovery, development, and uh, eventually uh, CDX commercialization. We have multiple partnerships with various pharma and always look to expand those. Today though, we're gonna focus on our on-market clinical testing, uh, where we have currently tests for nodules. So our focus is in lung and lung disease. So nodule testing using our notified tests um, to prognose whether uh, likelihood of benign or cancer and then um, using DDPCR uh, ex exclusively with our Genistrat test that, that to this point had focused on somatic variant mutations, fusions, uh, things such as opera threat, and another one of our mass spectrometry tests, Veristrat for prognosing uh, treatment decision-making in lung cancer. But today we'll focus um, exclusively on SARS-CoV-2 and how we've deployed, as uh, Carolyn introduced, the BioRad uh, DDPCR test 
platform, which has now uh, received uh, FDA authorization. A little bit about the technologies in the lab. Of course, um, today we're not focused on the proteomic side. I talked a little about that. Uh, but really focused here on uh, the DDPCR platform. We have a number of the QX 200s, which have been authorized for use in SARS-CoV-2 testing. Uh, we're not going to visit the DDPCR technology and how it works today. I think there are tons of resources on the BioRed uh, Digital Biology Group website uh, to enable uh, those of you that need to get up uh, to speed and learning. In terms of test development, uh, my desk is focused on uh, as we talked about, offerings from our CLIA labs. So the majority of our tests that are on market and used with pharma have actually been validated to the level of New York State CLEP, including the SARS-CoV-2 DDPCR test, which also has uh, New York State approval. So what have we done in terms of standing up the CoV-2 DDPCR test? Well, we've conducted according to FDA EUA templates all of the experiments necessary and have submitted to FDA on April 8th, um, our, F our EUA. That is still in review and um, we pen approval uh, actually any day now. The Biodesics Corporate Laboratory is where we conduct DDPCR. At the end of this uh, presentation, uh, I'll share with you some exciting news about our sister laboratory in Kansas and what we're doing there in the COVID 2 fight. Uh, but to stay focused, um, everything we'll talk about today is done in Boulder, Colorado. A number of certifications exist on the laboratory, include, including CLIA CAP. We talked about New York State CLEP. We're also ISO certified, one of the few uh, CLIA labs in the United States that actually operates under a quality um, management system that meets ISO 13485 certification. Specifically in terms of COVID 2 testing in the laboratory, since we do bring a uh, live virus into uh, the laboratory is that we have a BSL-2 enhanced clinical uh, testing laboratory. I'll show you a little bit more about the laboratory and how we process specimens. Looking into the lab, and this is a subset of the droplet uh, readers in the lab from Biorad. So we operate six independent workflows currently, uh, processing in two shifts, uh, specimens coming in for SARS-CoV-2 testing. We've processed at this point uh, close to, or, or maybe a slightly over 5,000 independent specimens since we started testing on April 7th. In terms of capacity, um, you know, congratulations here to our team um, that executes now in two shifts greater um, than 2,400 specimens can be handled per day, though we continue to look at how we scale that up um, and also increase or improve our specimen turnaround time. Um, in terms of laboratory access, the lab is open seven days a week and operating uh, two shifts. Turnaround time, um, we'll talk a little bit more about why um, this is prioritized uh, versus regular, regular, but our prioritized turnaround time from sample pickup to result delivery now is averaging about 22 hours um, for not prioritized, and this is based on hospital sites sending in, not our decision. Those are regularly uh, delivered within 24 to 48 hours, though you'll see on average, most specimens are delivered within 30 hours. So from an analytic perspective, when samples arrive at our lab to when they're ready for release, that time is, is more like 18 hours. One of the questions we often get is, um, especially now as um, COVID-2 PCR tests are being stood up and run at these great volumes, is how many times do you have reruns? I can say of about 5,000 specimens we've processed. Invalids are approximately 0.2%, so actually a very, very small number. And just for context, our rerun rate is less than 1.8% 1, 1 in our targeted mutation genus red test. A little bit about the test itself. Monica will go into this in much, much more detail as she describes the BioRad EUA and, and the performance there. Um, but in terms of overview, this is a single tube triplex assay. Acid design reference is based on the current validated CDC uh, test with three uh, targets, so the viral targets being N1 nucleocapsid 1, N2 nucleocapsid 2, and then there's an internal uh, human gene encoding RNAs P or RPP30. The primary specimen type we look at today is nasopharyngeal swab or NP. 
and we are looking at expanding capabilities for other respiratory specimens, key being saliva. So we're not going to talk about the saliva uh, data today, but just so you know, it is successful and we're continuing to do work with match saliva and NP. In terms of the swabs themselves, they can also be collected into a variety of media equally well uh, performance we've seen from UTM, Universal Transport Media, VTM, Viral Transport Media, Amy's, as well as saline. The workflow in the clinical lab looks like this, and I want to spend a few minutes because there are um, really two modifications to the BioRad EUA approved platform, um, but included in our EUA submission. Uh, specimens arrive at laboratory. In our case, these are from a local um, hospital network. I'll show you what that coverage is like um, in Colorado. Those specimens arrive on cold packs. They're accessioned into our secure system. RNA is extracted and then moved into a one-step uh, DD-PCR process with droplet generation uh, being one of the first steps that happens. We then move on to data analysis. I'll share a uh, result from actual clinical samples that we've tested. And then in our case, those are all bundled into a spreadsheet and transmitted securely uh, to the ordering hospital. So stepping back a bit, where the two differences are is in RNA extraction. So we use a manual method that was developed and optimized in the laboratory, whereas Biorad in their EUA um, have developed and optimized for two automated platforms. So this just adds another dimension to how the test can be used. Um, in terms of the DDPCR uh, procedures, we've also optimized and have a significant number of these manual droplet generators. And so that is the preferred method in the laboratory, though the automated DG, uh, which is included in, in the BioRed platform in UA, works equally as well. Uh, we've just gotten technician so very, very good at using these automated, these manual DGs that they, this is their preferred uh, method. So stepping a little into the lab, as I said, we perform everything from viral inactivation, um, since we receive uh, these swab specimens in which the virus, virus is still live. That's the first step in the process. Um, and then subsequently, obviously, we get to these manual DGs. You can see, I think we have six of these um, currently shown here, um, where we process the specimens, generate the droplets, which then move on to PCR and um, eventually reading and resulting. So a quick tour through the lab and the workflow and recognition, of course, for our technicians who are uh, really key in executing this workflow day in, day out. So representative data. Um, so this is a typical three controls on the plate, um, 93 unique test specimens. Uh, we have uh, a spiked in positive control. This is the exact control. So from, I think, two weeks ago, a uh, coffee chat with the BioRad team. There was a team member from Exact talking about uh, the use of that control. This is what we employ uh, currently. There is a no template control. Of course, the only thing you should be seeing there are negative droplets. And then uh, we also include an extraction control that follows the samples all the way through extraction, uh, droplet generation, uh, PCR, and result generation. And here we use the A549 uh, human cell line. See the results summarized uh, on the table below where the positive control, again, the exact control shows positive uh, copies for N1, N2, as well as RPP30. These are shown um, in a 2D plot up here. Negative droplets, positive droplets for RPP30, and then N1, N2 here. I'll show you better examples in a moment. The no template control, of course, is negative all the way across, and the extraction control um, is only positive from this human cell line for RPP30. So we get a lot of questions about the dynamic range of the DDPCR assay and how well that would work in the real world. These are representative positive specimens from our testing. And what I want to highlight is the great variety of droplets um, in terms of their intensity that you can see represented here. These are primary data. Um, the two, the middle uh, panel on the lower row and the one in the far right show extremely high positives. So we can see the negative droplets. We see the RPP30 gene. And basically what you have here with the blue, the orange, and the green are either individual N1, N2, or hybrids of N1, N2. 
If we go to the far right um, upper panel, uh, all of you, I think, are basically able to see, at least myself in this view, are the negative droplets and RPP30. But this is also a positive sample, so it's, it's very faint. Um, you can also see a number of N1 and N2 represented. So great dynamic range, and I'll actually show you data um, summarized from our on-market testing, how that translates for, again, uh, more than 5,000 samples. But first, some of the studies that we had to perform uh, per the FDA template now using the BBPCR assay um, shown here. So limit of detection, we use 60 specimens to establish this. We also have to conduct the clinical evaluation sensitivity and specificity. So 30, 30 um, specimens would spike in or not of BEI ATCC uh, control. An accuracy study was conducted immediately as we went on market, and this was with an external lab that had already an EUA-approved test. This happened to be the Rush SARS-CoV test um, on the COPUS platform. And here we sent, as required, our first five positive and negative specimens, and we achieved 100% concordance. In terms of exclusivity and cross-reactivity, this was the in silico analysis. This is actually included in the BioRat EUA for their authorization. And so as you read that, um, you can see details of what was done in silico to assure and uh, no cross-reactivity um, with this primer probe set. In terms of scoring, I'll simplify what appears to be um, very complex. Um, starting at the bottom with the invalids, that's where we see no signal at all in the specimen. So no signal for um, N1, N2, or the test control gene. What we found here is rather than any sort of inhibition, really uh, what we get is um, either strange droplet patterns and so sort of diluting the sample. Um, so this is generally what in our experience is too high of a viral load that you don't get it in the first time. So then you perform a rerun and we've been able to resolve most all of our invalids except for a small number. Um, in the case it repeats, that is continues to be invalid then a new specimen collection is, is advised. I showed you earlier that that rate is really only 0.2% for us. Um, negative specimens, so we do now see quite a few negative specimens as we've opened up um, our testing in response to the hospital requests. And that is where neither N1 nor N2 is present, um, but the human RPP30 gene is, and so this is a negative uh, result. A positive, on the other hand, as you might expect, is actually either N1 or N2. In our testing, we've always seen N1 and N2, um, and so not a situation where one or the other has appeared. Um, but what is interesting, according to the guidance um, here from CDC, is that um, RP can be positive or negative. And so I've gotten questions about this as well, so I want to relate that all the data we've generated to date RP has been present along with N1 and N2 um, in positive specimens. So we've not seen a situation where we've had N1, N2, but no RPP30. So on to some of the data, um, and, and I'll really summarize some of this because it's a lot of data uh, generated in a very short time um, of what our experience has been. So demographically, we can see the age distribution in the bar chart on the left, really median ages um, that show um, that we've been receiving are in that 40 to 69 age group. And I'll show you results on, on how the spread of positive and negatives are um, in that range. In terms of gender, um, probably not significant, 41, 56% split uh, male to female. So we've got a good, um, I would say, unbiased representation of gender. Um, in terms of footprint, so Bidesix is currently, as I, as I said initially, supporting testing in the state of Colorado and now looking at expanding nationally. As of May 6, we delivered test results uh, to patients covering 42 of the 64 Colorado counties. So in terms of testing and results and positives, everyone's interested, of course, in positives, but equally um, important are you know, what is the prevalence? So negatives are, are also important. Today, our rate stands at 3.9%. A couple of weeks ago, uh, when we did a presentation um, here with the BioRat team as well, 
that stood, I think, at about 13%. I'll show you in a minute. Um, the high point of positives for us was actually 31% on one day, and we'll go into why that is. Um, positive rate by gender, again, no real differences. And one of the things I wanted to point up is I'm actually in the bottom here, where the majority of positives now at this point are coming in the age group of 40 to 70. So where the majority of those uh, patients were, and that's where we're seeing um, you know, about 72% of positives falling into that group. Interestingly, in the younger age, so between um, you know, zero and 39, we have um, the second highest number, so 22% of positives, whereas in the very elderly, so 80 to 105 years old, um, one individual is actually tested in our screening for elective surgeries, that was 105. We've only seen a 6% positivity rate, but this um, probably reflects uh, stay-at-home, safer-at-home policies. So how does this break down? When might as it started testing? Uh, Frontline inpatient testing um, was the population um, that we were uh, being sent. And as you can see in those days, um, positivity rates, like I said, uh, crept up to 31% as we were looking mostly at healthcare uh, professionals and inpatient. As the state of Colorado um, eased up to our safer at home policies, and hospitals could now um, screen and open up for elective procedures. We saw a, a dramatic shift, uh, both in volume of tests being received as well as positivity rate. So where today we're at uh, less than 1% positive. So interesting shift as we contemplate uh, workplace opening and so on, um, showing though that the curve has definitely been flattening here in Colorado. In terms of dynamic range and concordance between N1 and N2 target, I told you earlier that we really see significant concordance between N1 and N2, not just in their occurrence, but also in copy numbers, and that's shown here. We actually had to abbreviate the graph um, plot at 500,000 copies because, again, in individuals um, with clinical symptoms, those copy numbers can be in the range of um, five. 500,000 or up to 20 million copies per 20 microliter reaction. So really severe um, acute disease has very, very high uh, viral load. So in order to accommodate, we crop these graphs at 500,000. Same thing shown here. Now, in order to illustrate a dynamic range of DDPCR assays, we did the same thing. Recall that these numbers can be upwards of 20 million, uh, but we wanted to get comparison between, sort of to show you in numbers, what the first 250 patients look like, that's the plot on the left, and what the most recent 250 patients look like. Uh, this data cutoff was, I think, the 6th of May, and you can see now we're mostly negatives, uh, whereas we were um, very highly positive in those first 250. In terms of turnaround time, this is also shifted uh, based on the need of the population for that rapid turnaround time. So again, initially, um, in the blue pie slice here, we can see uh, turnaround time was um, for 24 hours or less was at 32.1%. That need shifted as um, now to averaging around 20, 82% of specimens being returned in 20 hours or so um, because of this screening for elective surgeries. So the procedure is three days earlier, patient specimens are sent to biodesics, we have to return a result in um, by noon, which turns out to be less than 24 hours, so actually about 18 hours, um, in order for that patient to then be contacted, their result, and um, the surgery to be scheduled. So that is really driving these rapid turnaround times. I think we've got a technical which I'm not able to advance. Okay, let me see if I can help with that. Thank you, Carolyn. You should be on slide 26, is that correct? Um, I think it's moving now, but it's blank. Okay, sorry, one second, everybody. We've got some questions coming in from our audience that apparently um, are experiencing the same thing. So I can go ahead and talk to the next slides if you want, Carmen. 
Yeah, I can see it appears I can go back. Let's just give it one second. Yeah, you may have to just talk to the next one, uh, your next slide, and, and we'll I'll keep working out in the background right. here. Thanks. So the next slide really was the summary closing slide, and this really pointed to uh, some of the data I shared earlier in terms of the you know the turnaround time, the uh, EUA submission that MyDesix has done. Um, and then importantly, though, what we wanted to talk about is the introduction of the serology test. Um, so the Biorad uh, Clinical Diagnostics Group recently announced uh, commercialization of that antibody test um, worldwide. And so we are proud to say that we're standing this test up now in our laboratory in uh, Kansas. So that team has been working very, very hard on validating um, the use of the Platelia SARS-CoV-2 total antibody test. And we're very excited to get that up and going here um, later in the month. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge all of the teams um, for contributing. This by no means is comprehensive. There are many, many other team members at Biodesics, Biorad, um, who've contributed to getting this test, uh, the PCR version, up and going and soon uh, pairing that with the antibody test. So both in Boulder and in um, DeSoto, Kansas, as well as Digital Biology Group, I'd like to call out Lisa Jensen Long, Diana Mar Monica, who you're here from today, uh, Maria Carlin, um, who's on here, and then Morris and their work with the CDG group, uh, Patrice, Jean-Francois, um, David, and John Massel. And importantly, um, Dr. Longshore of Atrium Health, who helped us con conduct um, the external accuracy study. Thank you very much. And Monica, over to you. Thank you, Gary. That was a great comprehensive overview of the biodesics experience. Very nice. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar from wherever you may be. Um, in this section, I want to go over the information of our EUA-approved SARS-CoV-2 DDPCR test, and I will give details on the validation studies that we submitted to FDA. So both Carolyn and Gary mentioned this already, but it bears repeating. The test received emergency use authorization approval uh, by FDA on May 1st, and it is intended for the qualitative detection of nucleic acids from SARS-CoV-2 in nasopharyngeal swab specimens and other upper respiratory specimens. The triplex assay contains the primers and probes based on the CDC sequences targeting specific regions of the nucleocapsid gene, um, N1 and N2 regions, as well as an internal control targeting the human RNAs P gene. We currently offer this test um, as individual components, but we will be offering a kit soon where all of these components are under a single part number. They will include the triplex assay, the one-step RT-DDPCR supermix reagents, and the exact diagnostic um, standards, positive and negative, that serve as the controls. After RNA extraction, the DDPCR workflow consists of four steps, um, which I reviewed in more detail in a previous webinar about two weeks ago. But now briefly, um, we'll go with the first step, which is the RT-DDPCR reaction setup with the reagents provided in the kit, then droplet generation on the automated droplet reader, uh, on the automated droplet generator. And then once the sample has been dropletized, um, it goes onto the thermal cycler for reverse transcription and PCR amplification in a single step. Once the thermal cycle product is ready, it goes to the droplet reader. And with the reading complete, the data is analyzed with the Quantisoft Analysis Pro software. As Gary mentioned, the, the workflow is very scalable. Uh, 93 patient samples, this is a 196 well plate, including the controls, can be completed in six and a half hours. And three runs per instrument per day gives you 279 patient samples. But as you can see with the biodesic experience, you can scale up um, quite easily with this workflow. This is a triplex assay, which means that all three targets are detected in a single well test. 
Thresholding, as I mentioned, is performed on the QuantiSoft Analysis Pro software using the probe, tri uh, probe mix triplex mode. And following the colored grid that appears when the graph tools are selected for clustering that we can see here at the bottom right side of the slide. As seen as the, in this 2D plot, we have the FAM channel amplitude on the y-axis and the hex channel amplitude on the x-axis. And for this test, we have eight possible cluster combinations that can occur. Starting with the triple negative cluster seen here in gray, that has droplets that are negative for all three targets. Then we have our first diagonal with single positive clusters that have positive droplets only for one target at a time. Here in red, we have the N1 FAM positive cluster. In yellow is the N2 FAM and hex positive cluster since this target has a probe mix. And in purple, the RP um, cluster positive in hex. Our next diagonal has the three double positive clusters with the combinations that here in tan, we have the N1 and 2 double positive cluster, in light blue, the N1 RP positive cluster, and in pink, the N2 and RP double positive cluster. And finally, on the top right um, of this plot, we have our triple positive cluster that has droplets that are positive for all three targets. As Gary mentioned, we um, every run needs to include a positive and extraction and a no template control. And similar to what he described for our positive control using the exact diagnostic standard, we can see that N1 and N2 and RP are positive. The extraction control has no viral targets and only the internal control RP target is positive. And finally, the no template control should have no positive droplets and be negative for all three. If the results perform as expected, then the rest of the plate and the samples can be interpreted following the guide. I won't repeat it, but it's, it's the same as what Gary mentioned. And what I would like to point out is that we have two main parameters to which um, base, we base our interpretation as SARS-CoV-2 detected, not detected, or invalid. And it's based on the copies per microliter um, concentration, as well as the number of positive droplets uh, per well. Both of these conditions need to be met to uh, call a test either detected when it's positive for both in one and in two, or only one of the two targets, or negative when there are no um, in one and in two, but RP is present, and um, invalid if none of the targets are present. And as Gary mentioned, this could be due to um, inhibition, uh, either due to interference in the sample or too high of an RNA um, concentration. In this case, you can repeat the RTDD-PCR reaction or um, repeat the extraction and the test. And usually that resolves most of the invalid results. Now I will go over some of our um, validation data that we submitted to FDA. First, uh, the inclusivity study. We performed this in silico. And although the test uses the same sequences as the CDC EUA assay, we assessed all of the new sequences deposited in the GSA aid and NCBI databases from February 1st to April 6th. There were 4,431 um, that covered the target region of the N1 assay and 4,413 4, sequences that covered the target region of the N2 assay. For N1, 98.2% of the genomes available match all three assay components perfectly. The 77 remaining genomes contain a single mismatch for all three assay components. For N2, this percentage was even higher with 99.5% of the genomes available matching perfectly. 
and 21 genomes contain one total mismatch. In this scenario, the risk of a single mismatch resulting in a false negative result is very low due to the assay design that has melting temperatures greater than 60 degrees and the thermocycline run conditions with an annealing temperature of, at 55 degrees, which tolerates up to two mismatches. This study passed. Similarly, we performed in silico analysis for the 41 pathogens recommended by the World Health Organization, which were a mix of viruses and bacteria that cause respiratory disease. A GenBank reference sequence was downloaded per genome for each of these organisms and compared against all of the targets in the test for all possible combinations to determine homology percentage. If any of these primer combinations were matched to a sequence on opposite strands with a homology of greater than 80% on the same target within a short distance apart, which was 100 base pairs or less, then potential amplifications were flagged. From our analysis, no potential unintended cross-reactivity was expected, except for the forward primer of the N2 target that showed high homology to bad SARS-like coronavirus. However, the reverse and probe sequences showed no homology. So in summary, the, the conclusion was that there is no prediction of potential false positive results with the test. And this study also passed. For the limit of detection studies, we created contrived samples by, by pooling SARS-CoV-2 negative nasopharyngeal specimens and spiking in synthetic viral RNA. Uh, we used the Acuplex SARS-CoV-2 reference material from Seracure. We performed a screening run with eight concentration levels, which we tested in triplicate extractions. Then we performed a confirmation run by testing the three lowest concentrations from the initial screening run with 20 extraction replicates each. The LOD was determined as the lowest concentration to show positive N1 and N2 in 95% or greater of the replicates tested, meaning 19 out of 20. In our study, the lowest concentration that passed this criterion was 625 copies per ml. Something to note is that variations such as input volume into the extraction will have an impact into how many copies go into the reaction. We have validated two um, extraction kits and for the thermal extraction, the input volume is 100 microliters, meaning that with an elution of, of 75 microliters, the expected total copies that go into the DDPCR reaction is 4.2. The input volume for the chiogen extraction is slightly higher. It's 140 microliters, meaning that with the same elution volume, you have an expected total copies of 5.8 going into the DDPCR reaction. So here we show the detailed results for the thermal MagMax kit, um, and they're shown in the table. And the LOD was determined as 5.2 copies per reaction for the N1 target and 5.8 copies per reaction for the N2 target. Similarly, for the chiogen extraction, we see that the LOD was determined to be 6.5 copies per reaction for N1 target and seven copies per reaction for the N2 target. This corresponds to an LOD of 625 copies per ml for both extraction kits that were validated. This study also passed. And finally, we performed a clinical evaluation with 79 clinical specimens collected from patients with signs and symptoms of an upper respiratory infection. The samples were tested at an external lab with a SARS-CoV-2 RTQ-PCR test that is EUA approved, and it was designated, and they were designated positive or negative based on the manufacturer's instructions. There were negative samples as well as a range of low, moderate, and high positive clinical samples. These were blinded, randomized, and tested with the BioRad SARS-CoV-2 test. And a data set was generated with each of the extraction kits um, that we validated.
Starting with the MagMax extracted samples, as we can see in this two by two table, there were 37 true positive and 37 true negative samples. One sample was invalid and there was no material left to uh, repeat the extraction, so it was left out of this analysis. Four samples showed discordant results where two were positive with the comparator test, but negative with the BIRET test, and two were negative with the comparator test, but positive with the BIRET test. This resulted in both a positive percent agreement and a negative percent agreement of 94.87%. For the Kyogen extracted samples, there were 35 true positives and 38 true negatives. Two samples did not have enough material to test and were excluded from this analysis. And what's interesting and expected was that the four same samples that showed discordant results with the previous data set um, were also discordant here. In this um, set, the positive percent agreement was 94.59% and the negative percent agreement was 95%. We performed discordant case analysis with the CDC EUA panel, and these results were 100% concordant with the BIRAT SARS-CoV-2 test, as shown in the table here, where the first two samples that were positive with our test, negative with a comparator, were confirmed positive with the CDC assay. And the same with the two samples that were negative with our test, positive with a comparator test, were confirmed negative with the CDC assay. So with this, the clinical evaluation study passed. The results from all of these studies were submitted to FDA. And as we've been mentioning from the beginning, uh, we received EUA approval on May 1st. You can find the instructions for use as well as the fact sheets for healthcare providers and, the, and patients on the FDA website dedicated to COVID-19 as well as on our BioRad website. And with that, I'll hand it over to Diana. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Monica and Gary, for those really nice presentations on uh, COVID-19 uh, diagnostic testing and how that's um, going um, with our Droplet Digital PCR. Um, today, I thought I would take a few minutes to uh, go over the Droplet Digital PCR technology and um, describe how it's enabling the research and development um, work that's going on around um, the uh, vaccine and treatment development for the virus. So droplet digital PCR is quantitative by nature. It, um, and for that reason, there's no need for the development of standard curves in order for you to get quantitative data out of the uh, technology. Um, for that reason, uh, assays can be developed very quickly and it lends itself to very robust lab to lab and day to day reproducibility. So the reason that you don't need a standard curve is because the sample, the reaction, uh, is partitioned into thousands of droplets, which are thermal cycled to endpoint and then read yes and no. And so there's a physical count of the molecules that are in the sample. Um, this makes for, again, a very robust uh, uh, PCR technology, not just because it allows for quantitation, but it also allows for very sensitive detection of low copy number um, samples. So that makes it ideal for things like monitoring and surveillance, other activities that are going to be very important in the coming months and are important today. Um, there's also uh, this partitioning technology allows for single nucleotide variant det detection, very sensitive uh, single nucleotide variant detection, which is gonna be um, something that we're probably going to hear a lot more about as we learn that these strains that are developing um, single nucleotide variants that are in critical proteins um, that can have possibly different virulences. So um, the other, uh, characteristic of droplet digital PCR, which is an endpoint detection. So you're thermal cycling all the way to endpoint and then reading. And that allows you to be relatively insensitive to sequence variants under the primer uh, region. And for these um, RNA viruses, 
um, they will accumulate uh, variants and mutations over time. And so within the next year or two, it's very likely that a lot of these assays that are being used today in order to detect the virus will start to develop those variants. But with DDPCR, and as I'm going to show um, in a later slide, you can tell the difference between um, a, a normal variant and one that contains a mutation or two, uh, simply by looking at the um, the cluster position on the plot. And so you'll know that it's time to possibly start looking at a redesign for those primers. And you're also still able to quantify those samples. So today, Droplet Digital PCR has a number of solutions that are being used um, to enable testing uh, for um, vaccines, as well as for the cell and gene therapy market. Um, and so some of those uh, kits that are available today. We are the E. coli and Cho residual DNA kit as well as a mycoplasma DDPCR kit, which is coming soon. We have gene expression assays available today. We have um, a design engine that can provide assays for on the fly um, assay design. We have um, also for copy number assays, we have um, that available um, as well as single nucleotide assay design engine. Um, and that's all, all of those assays are without a standard curve and so they provide quantitative results and very excellent reproducibility as well as an absolute count um, because these are being physically partitioned and counted. In the next slide here, what I'm showing is an example of a recent study for, from a lab using droplet digital PCR um, in order to develop a vaccine for Ebola. This is actually a virus-like um, particle, so a VSV um, for the Ebola. And you can see on the left panel here, uh, DDPCR results for titering that virus. And so this publication just came out in December of 2019. This is currently being done um, today and uh, similar uh, studies will be needed for uh, any uh, COVID-19 vaccine development. The next slide that I'm showing here is just really to point out the dynamic range, which Gary mentioned earlier, that dynamic range is going to be an important um, feature of any technology used for um, infectious disease, um, not just um, detection, but also for monitoring. You can see that this tenfold dilution series of a Zika um, RNA in our one-step RT-DDPCR, that in this tenfold series that you get re very robust results all the way down to um, single copy number detection. And you can see that that error bar is extremely um, small. And in this case, we do have this Zika virus um, assay available today. In the next slide, I wanted to just take a minute to take a look at some of the older work that has been done using our system uh, with the HIV community. So all the way back to the technologies launch, the viral community, specifically HIV community, has found value in using Drop the Digital PCR. Namely, they were looking at treatments and vaccines, but they could never say that a patient was cured because the level of detection that they were able to get with qPCR was not low enough for them to be able to detect very low viral loads. And so in this publication, they state that they were able to get between five and 20 fold improvement in precision and accuracy um, over their RT qPCR assay. In the next slide here, I show the chart where the expected copies um, versus the measured copies. And you can see in this gray, in this hatched region, that was their qPCR. Um, data where they were not able to get quantitation. This was a range that they could not reach with that um, assay. So in with DDPCR, you can see with the diamonds and the uh, square that they could then now get down into that very, very low range. That really was enabling for um, this community. In the next slide, um, there's a chart where they also showed that they could detect mismatched um, uh, virus, so viruses that had uh, nucleotide differences under the primer regions for the assays that they were using in order to detect and quantify the viruses in these patients. And in the gray, solid and hatched region, 
the matched um, DDPCR is solid and the unmatched um, DDPCR is the gray uh, hatched <clears throat> bars. And you can see that you can still very easily detect and quantify um, the virus in these samples, even though there's a mismatch. However, in the qPCR results, in many of these cases, it was severely um, low as well as being, in some cases, completely missed. So in summary, Droplet Digital PCR um, already has a suite of solutions um, that are enabling and advancing the studies around the COVID-19 vaccine development and treatment development, being able to quantitate without a standard curve, um, is extremely important. I want to emphasize here that our EUA is um, for the current assay is qualitative and not quantitative. Um, however, um, again, DDPCR is quantitative by nature. However, if you use it uh, uh, as a quantitative assay, that is off label from our EUA. Um, the sensitivity of DDPCR enables very low viral samples to be measured and quantitated, which is important for following treatment response. Also viral titer and vaccine titering is also being done by researchers today um, in the cell and gene therapy market and the va vaccine development market. And with that, I'm gonna hand this over to um, Carolyn and we're gonna answer some of your questions. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you, Gary, Monica, and Diana for presenting us with that information. I'm really sorry we had some connectivity issues with Diana's section. As a reminder, the slides will be available for download. Um, so we'll open it up now for the questions. So our first question, uh, Gary, is for you. What are some of the key elements of the lab workflow that you have uh, have enabled to provide you with results in less than 24 hours? And specifically, can you talk about your data analysis pipeline? It's a great question, Carolyn. So um, key aspects, of course, had to be worked out. I would say starting um, very early on with the specimens being sent in and their manifest. So one of the things that happens is that manifest is sent electronically from the time the samples have been assembled for pickup by courier, and that's sent to us ahead, probably you know average about an hour before the specimens arrive, so the team can start reconciling any issues with that manifest. So it's really easy as, it, as the specimens come here for us to, to correlate what's actually received versus you know, what was sent. So that's been highly optimized. The other aspect um, in accessioning, um, really um, in comparison to data analysis, accessioning is the, the, the bit that needs to be really worked out. Um, so reconciling a great number of specimens. Um, with their ID. So we've set up multiple accessioning stations. So we have up to three different workflows that are able to go on for accessioning and viral extraction since we're obviously using a manual method. So the team really collaborates. Uh, there are two people, we used to be three um, involved in the accessioning, uh, checking specimens, um, withdrawing samples for viral inactivation, and really honing down that um, piece of things is where we saw the, the best um, data gain um, in terms of time. Um, data analysis, you know, I, I can't speak for the team, but one of the things we've done is automate the process of retrieving data from the QX200 onto our analysis, which is um, now assisted and every specimen is reviewed manually. So data is transferred um, as it's completed up to our servers, which can then be analyzed, um, if you will, immediately. So those are some of the key the key bottlenecks, but I would advise anyone trying to do this, focus on accessioning. Great. Um, another question for you, Gary. Uh, what's been the biggest bottleneck in the U.S. for COVID testing? And uh, specifically, what are you guys doing to, to help overcome or deal with that? Yeah, so that's an interesting uh, question. So publicly, of course, I think everyone is aware um, in terms of NP, uh, conducting uh, nasal swabs, um, the shortage in swabs, right? So, so that's a well-known um, issue that affects everyone who is involved in, in collection of those specimens. Um, downstream of that, it really depends on whose platform you're going to use, which is why we looked at multiple, multiple methods of really doing that viral um, inactivation extraction. So uh, while we've settled on a manual method, automated methods um, remain um, a part of what we're attempting to do and optimize. Though much of the platforms for doing that 
um, if you get into it, you'll find that there's um, allocations in process with platforms and um, assays from Thermo and from Kaijin. So really having multiple options on extraction is, is key um, as, um, you know, frontline testing hotspots. Those are going to be places where those instruments um, and kits go. So really having multiple options um, in place for viral extraction, I think is key. Um, on the sample collection side, what we've started doing, and I mentioned a little bit here, is looking at other specimen collection types. So focused on um, saliva primarily. Now FDA has approved at least one uh, test kit um, in conjunction with the EUA authorization of the Rutgers test. So now you can do home specimen collection, still supervised, um, and send that in. And we really see, um, in addition to, to swabs, um, saliva being a good alternative. Great. That's a great segue into another question we have for our audience, for both you, Gary, and for Monica. Um, are you testing other sample types in addition to those nasal swabs? Have you performed studies on saliva, for example? Gary, I'll let you go first. Thanks, Monica. Um, so since I alluded to it and, and we're engaged in this actively right now, we, um, even prior to the one uh, device being approved by FDA, um, collaborated with a number of different vendors of saliva specimen collection kits, um, as well as companies who um, previously had been in saliva testing for a different reason. Um, and much like us as COVID came along, had capacity, had expertise, and moved into this. So we've been in discussion for the last four weeks um, with different either uh, vendors or uh, partners potentially to bring saliva um, into our testing um, field. Uh, where we are today is we've conducted testing um, on, on three, I think, um, different collection devices and really found one at this point um, to outperform the others. Funnily enough, it is the one that is FDA authorized. So um, currently that's the position we're in, is we're in feasibility um, and validation with at least one of those specimen collection devices. And from our side, uh, certainly from a, the commercial manufacturer's perspective, we want to enable labs to implement our tests and resolve as many bottlenecks as possible. So we are assessing other extraction methods and looking at extraction free methods um, and plan if we have uh, positive results. We plan to submit a supplement to our EUA, um, to FDA, and as well as um, validating other sample types such as saliva. And for this effect, we are working closely with our uh, collaborators to get these specimens. Um, and also we continue to, to partner with Biodesics on this. Great. Thank you all. I'm so sorry. We're out of time. We're at the top of the hour here. So thank you to our speakers and our audience for your participation. There are a lot of questions we didn't get to. So we'll have someone from BioRat or Biodesics follow up with you directly in the next couple of weeks. As a reminder, today's webinar will be available on demand within 24 hours. You can check out the items in the resource list and get these slides downloaded. We'll also work on re-recording Diana's part and making that available to all of you. We apologize for the connectivity issues. There'll be a short survey that will appear on your screen now. We appreciate your feedback. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day and stay safe.